Hi there, I'm Dina Shabin, and you're watching The You and Human, an exploration of how we each navigate our own human experience. Today, we're stepping into the ring with a trailblazer who's breaking barriers and rewriting history. Ziad Al Mayouf is the first ever Saudi professional boxer. He is a symbol of grit, determination, and the power of dreams. From the roar of the crowd to the quiet moments of self reflection, his story is one of resilience, courage, and the relentless pursuit of greatness. Join me as we dive deep into the punches life throws at us and how we learn to fight back. I think what's really important to kind of touch on here is this idea of you being the first ever Saudi boxer, right? Ashen, the thing is, in the region, when we kind of grew up, and I think this was relevant to everything, basically, we didn't have these kind of heroes that we looked up to, mm -hmm. right? And so like, when you look at someone, you want to aspire to be something, you try to find something as closest to you as possible, and you, you didn't really have that. I know you did travel around yeah. quite a bit, but essentially you are from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And as you're growing, what, what, what was the moment that kind of sparked you into saying, you know, I actually want to be, I want to be a boxer? Like, why did you <laughs> pick that sport? I mean, I think uh, starting out, anybody starting out when we are young, we always look for self-value. Yeah. And uh, not necessarily only when you're young. I think throughout your life, you're always seeking self-value and, and you know, self-confidence and self-esteem. You're always seeking all of that. And when I was younger, what got me into boxing was that nobody was into boxing. So this is where I found that self-value because I would now do something that nobody else is doing. How old were you? I was 11. Really? <laughs> 11 years old. So I'd walk into school, you know, as a young kid, really, really seeking self-value and knowing that I have that self-value because I'm doing something no one else is doing in the school or even that I know. When did you start, like, the sports? I'm trying, I'm trying to yeah. go back into like the moment this happened. Like for me, I was a professional swimmer. My parents threw me in the water. It worked out really well. They're yeah. like, oh, she's got talent. So this is what we're doing for the rest of her life. And yeah. it worked out super well. Yeah. I was great at it. So like, what was the moment? Or like, was it something your parents did? Or did you watch a movie? Was it like Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali? What was it? I think it was, it was very, very strange. I think the stars aligned really. Ultimately, it came down to my mom because without her, it wouldn't have really happened because my dad was against it and she took me behind his back for a really long time. Really? Yeah, so I was in tennis before. Okay. And my dad loves tennis and his dreams were for me to become something in tennis. <laughs> so I was very young in tennis and when we'd go warm up for tennis, we'd go to the running track. And then, uh, you know, in, in the Nadi, <laughs> There's equipment and there are designated areas for each and every sport. You know, the gymnastics had the area and equipment, you know, the football, handball, everything. Yeah. But boxing didn't have, they didn't have a designated area or equipment. Okay. They just had a coach standing there with his, his mitts and people are lined up waiting, to, waiting for their turn. Okay. So when we'd warm up for tennis, we'd go to the running track next to the boxing people as they were training. So every single day, I'd warm up for tennis with the coach and I'd hear the boxing people, I'd hear the intensity, the, you know, the motivation. You could see the, that like beautiful kind of violence at the same time. And then it's just very hard to not get distracted by it because of the, the, the loud noise, the sound and all of that. So. Mm -hmm. I always thought this, this really, really needs a lot of skill, you know? So every single day, more and more, got more distracted with boxing until actually the boxing coach in the middle of my tennis warm-up walked to me and told me, every day you're, you're, you're distracted and you're looking towards us. How about you come try and, and I think you really, you re you really love it and, and all that. So, you know what, I, I really did. So I went and I spoke to my parents and I got the fastest no. <laughs> Ever. Yeah, the <laughs> sentence wasn't done because we're nine siblings. Oh, no Yeah, way. yeah, we're okay. six brothers, three sisters. 
and I'm, you know, one of the younger ones, so they didn't want <laughs> one coming out, coming up and, um, and you know, issues. fighting, yeah, with <laughs> issues and, and, you know, the stigma around boxing, it's a violent sport, uh, you know, the, again, a stigma, again, just the brain damage, this and that, and um, people really misunderstood violence or misunderstood controlled violence, okay. let's just say that, so. How would you describe it? I'm going to jump back into your story, but mm. now that we're talking about this, like, so what, what would you describe it as? Well, as boxing yeah. or controlled violence? No, no, like, because you're saying people misunderstand controlled yeah. violence, yeah. right? So what would you, what, how would you describe it? Not I that think you're in it. I'd describe boxing as the thing that keeps you away from violence the most. Mm. So keeps you away from combat the most, keeps you away from violence the most, keeps you away from anger the most because you control that so well, one, and two, you have nothing to prove. You have nothing to prove to yourself and you have nothing to prove to others. So what causes, you know, problems mostly in our lives or if it's a fight or if it's a problem with someone, even if it's just an argument, it's having a point to prove, right? And feeling that you really need to prove that point and that escalates the, the, the fight or the argument. In boxing, you have nothing to prove. To yourself, you have nothing to prove by getting angry, by getting loud. You have nothing to prove by eventually feeling the need to get violent because you already know what you can do. Mm. You already know you can, you can get angry, you can control it, and you could do so much with your anger. Mm. You already know you could get violent and you could beat someone with your violence, so you just don't feel the need to do it at all because you know that there's a time and place for it. Mm. And then... That's what boxing really gives you. There's a time and place for everything. If me and you start arguing right now and the cameras are on, then I understand, okay, this is not the time and place. I don't let the emotions, you know, cloud the thoughts or the emotions cloud the moment. And that's what boxing and, and sports like boxing really give you, that just controlled violence or the control over your emotions, I feel. Are you able to have, like, clarity in emotional situations outside of the ring? Definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely. Especially because I think clarity equals calmness mm. and calmness equals clarity. And so the only way to have clarity in all situations and in all emotional interactions is to just be calm. And no matter what happens, what happens you're calm. If it's good, you're calm. If it's bad, you're calm. If it's happy, calm, sad, calm, you're just calm around it all. And that's what boxing gives you because people think that you need to be angry to win the fight when it's the complete opposite. It's the moment you become angry, you lose the fight. Lost control. You lose the fight because you'll do something reckless that your opponent will uh, counter and, and, and beat you to. You'll do uh, something without thinking about uh, properly or you'll really project the punch because of how angry you are. So if it's a very good opponent, they'll, they'll know how to capitalize on that. So the whole point is boxing is the one sport where you get punched in the face, but you're not allowed to get angry. So then if you get punched in the face and you're not allowed to get angry, what really will anger you? You know, an argument, an insult. Uh, if it's someone, you know, talking behind your back, if it's someone that you trusted that ended up betraying you, all that stuff does not compare to being punched in the face mm -hmm. <laughs> and not being allowed to get angry. So that's the whole point, I feel, where you, you are just in control of all situations outside of boxing. You have that calmness and calmness equals clarity in everything. The moment you're not calm is the moment you need to take a step back and wait until you are because it would be so much, it would be a lot worth it when you're back into the argument, back into the fight, or back into whatever you're dealing with when you're calmer. Because then you're going to get into, you're going to get through it a lot faster mm. and a lot better. Fascinating. Uh, I want to go back to, the, so you, you, you got the fastest snow you've ever gotten in your life, yeah. <laughs> probably until this moment. Yeah. And then what did you do from there? I mean, my dad was always back and forth, traveling back and forth all the time. So most of the time I was with my mom, especially my, uh, my younger time, I'd say. Um, What's the number in the ranking of your family are you? So you're nine, you said? 
Yeah, yeah. So what no, number so are you? <laughs> I'm, I'm seven. Okay. There's eight and nine. Oh, no way. Okay. <laughs> There's eight and nine. Um, with my dad, one time he left, and I don't know what happened to my mom, what she watched or, or what she saw. Uh, I think it was a movie. I think it was a movie. She saw a movie. I don't know which movie exactly it was. It's got to be Muhammad Ali. I yeah, it has to be greatest. something. <laughs> but then she came up to me out of morning. She said, do you really, do you actually want to box? Do you really want to do it? I said, I really, really want to do it. She said, okay, I'll take you. I'll take you to do it. I said, what about, you know, my dad? She said, he, he won't, he'll know eventually. And I'll let him know um, eventually. But, but I'll take you now. I said, okay. Really? For a whole year, I'm boxing without my dad knowing. A whole year. And then my dad one day comes back and he's going to pick up his kid from tennis practice or he's going to watch him uh, play tennis. And he goes to the tennis coaches, where is the head, where is the head, where is the head? He hasn't been here in a year, <laughs> you know? And like, he yeah. didn't tell you guys, oh, I'm coming. He yeah. just decided to go. No, he just, sometimes he just comes suddenly and that's what he does, yeah. And then one day I'm training, I'm boxing, and I look, and it's my, <laughs> it's my dad <laughs> standing right there watching. But. You know, it was um, when he found out it wasn't actually it wasn't horrible. Mm. What it was was that he knew how serious it is, and he knew how important it was that I took it seriously. Yeah. So, to my dad, it was like, do you do you really want to box? So yeah, I really want to box. He said, okay, well then you have to prove it to me outside of the sport that you really want to box, especially if it's boxing, especially if I'm gonna have you know my son get you know, punched and, and punched and then have yeah. to control all that. So who are you hanging out with? Who are your friends? Where do you hang out after school? And uh, who are you hanging out with in those places after school? What time do you sleep? What time do you wake up? And even when you go out on Thursday, the last day of the week, what time do you come back that day to? And then do you train on that Thursday or do you not? That's what he instilled in me from day one what a good man. yeah from 12 13 years old i'd finish school on a thursday the last day of the week if i wanted to go out with my friends i'd have to go to training then i'd go out with my friends and because i was so tired from training i wouldn't make it out of course, yeah. <laughs> too late <laughs> so it, he just saw that so i had to really show him that i really want this and the way to do it is that i'm i'm controlling everything outside of boxing mm -hmm. and the only thing that's maintained I feel my career right now and and how much serious it's gotten is how I control it outside of boxing because the boxing is easy yeah. I've been doing the boxing since I was 11 and 12 but how am I going to control the pressure the stress and all of that yeah. and and the lifestyle that's what really carries through yeah it's very fascinating as well because he also agreed to say, I mean he finally said yes at a time when there were no you know, Saudi boxers, I don't yeah. know, to be honest, at the time as well, if we actually had many even in the region, there wasn't. There was yeah. nobody, there was there no wasn't. one. Yeah, no one, no one from the region. I mean, there were many that could have called themselves Arab or said they have an Arab heritage, but were you raised in the Arab world? Yeah. Were you raised around the minimal equipment? Were you raised around, you know, the minimal opportunities? But most importantly, were you raised around the minimal hope? So it's okay to have the opportunities or to have the equipment, but, but it's the hope that if you don't have in anything you're doing, then how are you really going to push through to create that hope? Because yeah. hope, hope is not like opportunity. Yeah. The right hope is not like opportunity where opportunity could be given to you or introduced to you or yeah. really just placed there for you. That's what opportunity is, but hope is not going to be that. Yeah. Hope is not going to pop out Hope is not going to, uh, you know, be introduced into your life alone. You really have to work to create hope. Yeah, it's and inside. You, exactly, exactly. It's inside and you have to create it. And that's the problem with a lot of people who are trying to chase something and they end up working for it for years and then they end up stopping, mm. you know, when the hope is not there. They get the opportunity, they chase this opportunity, they chase that opportunity. You could chase one opportunity and not get anything out of it. Chase the other, get so much out of it. Chase the third, get nothing out of it. Then you stop. That's hope. You already know the opportunity is there. But 
how are you going to keep going even the, if the hope is not there? So that's where you have to create that hope, you know, and, and then so many techniques come into place. If so it's how do you do it? The law of attraction, mm -hmm. visualization. These are key factors in my life. I'd say prayer, the law of attraction and visualization. I'm going to ask you, like, because I know a lot of people watching are going to be really interested in this part, I think, because this is a really, like, for me, when I discovered it, it really completely changed my life. But mm -hmm. I think it's one of mm -hmm. the real most difficult sort of, I want to say, tools, skills for you to learn how to do. So for And be you, convinced of. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you go from being in a space with little to no hope and learning to do visualization in a way where you can see it happening, believe that mm. you're there and know internally with no doubt that this is something that this is yours. Yeah. How do you do that? Well, the thing is, you first need to be convinced that confidence breeds hope, right? Confidence breeds hope and visualization breeds confidence. Okay. So it's a whole, you know, chain. So if you want to have confidence, then you need to have been in the place that you are trying to seek confidence in so many times. And you have already dealt with its struggles, with its uh, positives, with its negatives. You've already dealt with it. And you don't have to be there physically for, it, for you to deal with it. You could be there mentally before it. And that's what visualization is. Okay. Then when you're put in the situation in real life physically, you have so much confidence and that gives you hope to get through it and it gives you hope to go through it and then it gives you hope to even deal with it if there are bumps on the road getting through it and going through it. Mm -hmm. So the thing with visualization is this, um, you really have to, you know, first of all you need to push all cringe aside, okay. you know, you have to push your ego aside, mm -hmm. push all cringe um, ideas aside where before my first fight, you know, before my professional debut, How my first prof I was uh, 22. That's wow. my professional debut. Wow. And before my professional debut, the arena was 20,000 20, people. It was in Saudi Arabia. And, uh, you know, the pressure is really on the, uh, the stress. I'm feeling the stress. I'm feeling the pressure because I'm the first ever Saudi fighter and, you know, the first air fighter from the region. So the eyes are really on me but I didn't have the same experience before turning professional that others in the sport or in the boxing field do for me to really really be able to handle the pressure handle the stress and be able to have hope to carry out a very good performance in my professional debut one that would you know break the mainstream media break the international audience I really needed to make a statement so what I'd do was I'd close all the lights in my room and uh, there's also a point I'm just going to throw out there and then we can yeah. touch on later, yeah. the importance of having like a, a mental coach, a, a, you know, a therapist, a psychiatrist, a mental coach, a life coach, the importance of that, especially in the Arab world, we could touch on later, but I have a mental performance coach yeah. um, and he's Arab, he's, he's Egyptian actually. Amazing. And um, my mental performance coach told me, okay, he introduced me to visualization. He said, close all the lights in your room, shut it all off, and uh, you're going to open your laptop, you're going to search stadium crowd chants, lower the brightness completely. That's exactly what I did. He said, close your eyes, sit on your bed, sit on the floor, wherever you want to sit, and start visualizing exactly what you are going to do how you are going to feel, how you are going to deal with the emotions, everything. And I was in my hotel room, fight week. So that's a few days before the fight. Lights are closed, everything. And, and, I, and I have my eyes closed. The stadium crowd is chanting and I'm visualizing all what I'm going to do. And then the emotions are actually coming in. The real emotions are actually coming in. So the emotion of stress, the emotion of uh, pressure, the, the emotions of the butterflies before the fight. So then I found myself dealing with it, with the techniques that we, you know, you've been learning by, um, I don't like to call it seeking help, yeah. I like to call it seeking knowledge. Yeah. So by trying to seek knowledge from a therapist, a psychiatrist or a mental coach, the techniques they give you. So I'm practicing those techniques now to handle the pressure, handle the stress, handle the emotions of the moment, 
because the emotions are actually there because I'm visualizing literally that I'm there. Yeah. So it's actually going through it. So I've done it once, twice, three times. Every single day, I'm doing it three to four times. So then when the fight came, the emotions that I felt in the locker room before my professional debut, I've already had my professional debut 60 times. Mm. Walking to the ring, the emotions I'm gonna feel there, the crowd, everybody shouting my name and, and chanting, the butterflies you get from that, I've already felt that 60 times in my first 60 professional debuts that I've fought. I get into the ring and every single thing that could have happened in the fight, I've already visualized. Yeah. Uh, I ended up winning my first fight by a first round knockout. It was a crazy knockout. Broke the mainstream media, broke the international audience. Everybody was talking about it, the Saudi fighter, the Saudi fighter. And the best thing about it is I was calm because everybody has been speaking about it for 60 times. Yeah. <laughs> the mainstream yeah. media has seen the knockout 60 times, yeah. you know, and I've done it 60 times before when I was visualizing You visualized the knockout? I visualized everything. But the thing with visualization is you have to visualize the positive and the negative. Okay. Because it gives you calmness, okay. right? Calmness then gives you confidence. Confidence gives you hope. Yeah. So then what happens is it's very easy, it's very, very easy to have confidence and hope when things are going well and things are going good. But it's what breaks us most is when we lose the confidence and lose the hope. Or what I'd say is we don't know how to control the confidence or control the hope when things aren't going well. Because yeah. it's there. The confidence and the hope is there, even when it's not going well. Yeah. It's just so much harder to find it mm -hmm. and so much harder to trust it and so much harder to deal with it yeah. when things aren't going well. So with visualization, you have to know to visualize both positive and negative outcomes. Because I visualized me knocking him down and then I had to visualize him knocking me down. Because, you know, knockdown is when he goes down and gets back up. Yeah. Knockout is when he doesn't get, get back up. So something in boxing is when you get knocked down, it's so easy to just give up. And you know, it's so easy when you get back up and you continue the fight, it's so easy to give up mentally and, and just lose the fight. Yeah. You know, and same thing in life. Yeah. You know, when you take a bump, yeah. it's very easy. Even if you get back up, the easiest part is getting back up. What's so much harder is continue walking after you get back up. And that's the same thing in boxing. So you have to visualize him knocking me down up, him knocking me down, I get back up. Now, what are you going to do when you get back up? Everything is the same. You just got knocked down. You lost an extra point. Fight is still as is. He didn't win yet. It's not over yet. I still can win. And same thing, vice versa. If he gets knocked down, it's very easy as a fighter for me to get very crazy when he gets back up. I start getting reckless and too excited and I get caught with a punch and I lose the fight yeah. because I'm reckless. I'm not focused on my defense or I'm not focused on how composed I am attacking and all of that. So then I visualize knocking him down, him getting back up, nothing has changed. The fight is still the same. I didn't win yet. I have to continue with my plan. That's what happened in the fight, really. Yeah. He got knocked down, got back up, and even the commentators spoke about it in the fight. They said what's so amazing is that in his professional debut, he's very calm after he's knocked him, back, knocked him down and he got back up. He's not going all reckless and crazy. Mm -hmm. They said that word for word. That's because I've knocked him down 60 times before, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've yeah. knocked maybe the first time I wasn't able to control it when I was visualizing, but I've, I've learned to control it in my 30th, 40th, 50th time. Yeah. So when it happened, really, I was able to control it. And if it had happened to me, which it did in my second fight, I got knocked down and then I had to control all the emotions. But for everybody in the arena, and the commentators, this is the first time ever uh, Ziad and Mayuf gets knocked down. But for me, it was the hundredth time. I've been knocked down so many times before, but not only have I been knocked down, I've been knocked down and I've gotten back up and I've won the fight a hundred times before. You know, it's, you don't ever want it to happen, but what you don't want to happen even more is you're not being able to control it. Yeah. You know, got knocked down, controlled my emotions, got back up, continued to win the fight without knocking him down or out. I just won the fight by points, which is very hard to do when you have a knockdown against you. But 
Really? It all, yeah, it all starts here because I've been knocked down and won the fight so many times. So I've been there. It's so, I was confident. Yeah. So when you're confident in how you deal with yourself mentally and emotionally, there's always hope. There's always hope when you're that confident in how you're going to deal with yourself mentally. But the way to do that is to put yourself in the situations. Don't shy away from the, the tough times in life. Don't shy away from the tough moments, the tough emotions that you go through because of specific things you're going to meet in your life. Don't shy away from that because it all prepares you for a bigger moment. Yeah. Everything you go through that you think is huge and you've, you're not going to get through, you know, I hate to break it to you. You're going to get through it. That's a good thing. You're going to get through that moment. Trust me. But you will meet a worse <laughs> moment later on. You will Something meet, bigger, yeah. more challenging yep, is going to happen. Yep, you're going to meet a much bigger thing later. Yeah. You're going to meet a much more challenging moment later. And you're going to have to deal with that. And you're going to think this is the worst. And it's just the whole cycle. That's, I think that's the cycle of, of how life really is. Yeah. You know, this moment. I think one of the things that really helped me kind of understand that was like, I went through a lot of difficult, hard times. Also, I was a professional you know, athlete. And so you learn to be in very, very stressful situations. Mm. And having to kind of step outside the noise that's inside your head and recognizing that, like, I'm not that voice that's inside my head. I'm so much more than that, exactly. right? Because that's the noise that's been accumulated from outside all these years. And I think once you kind of learn how to do that, you're able to differentiate between is this my voice or is this the voice of fear and of other people's uh, opinions mm -hmm. and perspectives and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, and I think, honestly, like from what you're describing right now, it really seems like boxing is like a, <laughs> it teaches you how to deal with life. Yeah, right? definitely. Because definitely. you're going to fall down. You're going to have to learn to get back up. You're going to have to learn to continue with hope because that's, that's the only thing you can do to move forward. If yeah. you don't have hope, you know, it ends up getting into a spaces that are very dark, very depressing. And oftentimes it becomes very difficult to kind of pull yourself back up. Which is okay to happen. Yeah. So to, to have confidence in yourself when these moments hit, you know, to just have confidence that these moments will pass, that's the thing that brings the hope. So that's why I said don't shy away from it. Yeah. Don't shy away from the, the moments of depression, the moments of sadness, the moments of feeling like you won't ever get, get out of it. Don't shy away from these yeah. moments. Accept them. Take in these emotions. You have to deal with these emotions. But like I said earlier, is sometimes it's okay to take a step back, wait until you're calm, then face the struggle again. Yeah. You know, give yourself that little breathing period mm -hmm. to get a lot calmer because it's a lot more difficult to deal with the situation, mm -hmm. with the emotions mm -hmm. everywhere. Then you are going to be able to deal with those struggles because you'll understand, okay, you know what? The confidence is still there, even though it's a tough time. Mm -hmm. I know the confidence is still there. I know I still, I, ha I have the tools. I know, I, I know the hope is there, so now it's just a lot harder to find, but I will find it, yeah. right? And um, there's, uh, uh, there, there's a thing about stress that I really like to think about, and it's changed my life completely okay. when, you think about that, when you think about stress from that perspective. So first of all, there's always hope, even when your brain tells you there isn't. Yeah. There's, oh, there's, this is a quote that I always live by, you know, there's always hope, even if your brain tells you there isn't. Yeah. But then now let's go to stress, right? And that's yeah. what perspective of stress changes completely how you will deal with stress. And so how about we switch the idea that instead of thinking that stress stops us from doing something, how about you think about it that stress prepares us to do something? Because okay. really that's what stress is. Stress prepares you for a big moment. Stress notifies you. It's a big moment. And then stress gives you the tools to go through and get through the big moment. So how does stress do that is it gives you the sharpness. It gives you, you know, the alertness. It gives you you being awake. It gives you, you, you know, just being alert all the time. You know, what's happening around you. It gives you your reaction. It gives you your problem solving. And the urgency as well under stress, it gives you that urgency, yeah. you know. So when I say urgency, you know, separate urgency from uh, not being calm. You could be, you could, you could be 
in a state of urgency and still be calm. Yeah. You could be in a state of urgency and still be composed. You yeah. know, in a fight, I only have only a few rounds to win. It's a state of urgency, but I won't win it unless I'm calm, yeah. unless I'm composed. So stop relating the feeling of urgency with not being calm and composed. And that's what stress is. Stop relating the feeling of stress with the feeling of lack of control. It's the opposite. The feeling of stress is the feeling of peak control. It's the feeling of you're at most control because you're in a big moment under stress. Now I promise you, you're fully in control because you're as sharp as can be, as alert as can be, as aware as can be, as fast as can be, as strong as, as can be because you're under stress. But doesn't that also require like for you to learn how to have like clarity? Because I think a lot of the times, or this was my experience at first before I was able to learn to separate and differentiate mm. when most of the time we were never taught to recognize when we're stressed. Yeah. We always know it later once we've gotten ourselves sick or when it's too much, we can't, our nervous system can't take it, some sort of collapse happens. It's very important, I feel, to learn how to recognize when your physiological uh, reaction has uh, separated and changed from a space of equilibrium to a heightened space mm -hmm. where now there's something you need to look into. And so I think the stress is important, but I think my question now is how do you learn to live from a space of clarity and awareness so when there's a trigger, when you're under stress, you recognize that that's what it is. And in doing that, you end up bringing your internal state back into a space where you can live from a place of calm and clarity and act correctly moving forward in whatever space yeah. you need to be doing. Yeah, well, the way to do that is to understand not, you know, you're not seeking clarity before you understand um, when you are under stress and when you are going through these different emotions. It's to understand that you don't need to have complete clarity and you don't need to have complete any emotion before understanding how to deal with it, yeah. right? So when I understand that I'm under stress, it's me seeking 100% clarity that adds the negative stress, mm. you know? Because me seeking 100% clarity is something I can't control. Yeah. In a situation, in a high stress situation, in a big moment that, you know, big moments come hand in hand with stress. You won't go through or get through the big moments without stress. Yeah. But stress is only going to be there in moments where there isn't 100% clarity. Mm. So you can't be searching for 100% clarity in a moment of high stress, in a moment of big opportunity or something that means so much or a life changing moment or a career shifting moment. When you start looking for clarity in those moments, that's when you don't get through it. So it's the same idea of, again, touching on don't ever wait for 100% of any emotion before trying to get through it. So mm -hmm. don't ever wait to be 100% ready before, you know, taking the decision to do something, right. before taking the risk to do something. Because what stops us the most is waiting to be 100% ready. Yeah when we're never going to be 100% ready. And even after you do it, you're not going to be 100% about it. You know, whatever it is, career shift, risk, uh, breakup, you know, uh, proposal, whatever moment you are right now thinking about, yeah. you do not wait until you're 100% about it. Because if it's a high stress moment, if it's a big moment, if it's a, you know, life defining moment, you're not supposed to feel 100% about it. And if you do feel 100% about it, it's not life defining, it's not a high risk, and it's not yeah. a high stress situation. So then we don't even have to speak about it's it. It's not <laughs> your moment. <laughs> yeah, it's not your moment. It's yeah. the, so it's like, yeah. I seek high stress. Yeah. I, love, I love high stress moments. I seek high stress moments because now I understand what stress gives me. Yeah. I understand what fear gives me. I understand what pressure gives me. I understand that without stress, fear, and pressure, I wouldn't get through my fights. I wouldn't win my fights, yeah. you know, because I'm not as sharp, I'm not as alert, I'm not as, I'm not giving it as much importance um, as I need to, as I should. Yeah. So then it's, it's, it's not the same, but being able to deal 
with stress, but more importantly, looking at it half full, not half empty. Perspective changes everything. Yeah. That's what really gets me through it. Yeah. So we need that. And how did you learn all of these internal skills? Because mm. I think it's, like, <laughs> it's a very important way for learning how to navigate your own life. Yeah. In a way yeah. that serves you. you know, yeah. In a way that you're actually doing the, the best possible thing for yourself at any given moment. How did you learn to do all that? Uh, two things, you know, going through it and not being able to handle it and not being able to get out of it and uh, feeling lost and completely, you know, not in control, yeah. completely out of control. That is okay to go through. That is actually amazing to go through because when you go through similar situations again, after having gone through this one, you don't go through the same emotions. Right. You don't go through the same scenarios. You don't go through the same storm, yeah. right? You then learn to dance in that storm yeah. in specific ways to get through it. But in the beginning, when you're thrown in that storm, you're everywhere. Yeah. You don't know how to deal with the pressure, the stress, and, and all these internal thoughts. But we need to know that this is okay. So it all starts there. It all starts with um, self-compassion. Right. When you go through specific emotions that you weren't that you haven't ever gone through before, why are you expecting to be perfect and going through it? So when you go through situations you've never gone through before, why are you expecting to be perfect going through it? Yeah. You know, and it's our expectations of being perfect going through it that stops us from going through it. Right. Or that makes us beat ourselves up when we're going through it. You know, so then you find yourself, even when you go through a moment, instead of, you know, embracing the journey, embracing the emotions, you find yourself having gone through it. But when you look back, it was a horrible journey and it was, it was a horrible set of emotions that I had to go through. Yeah. But then you've, you've leveled up. Right. You've leveled up completely. You know, so one thing is going through the situation. The second part is the more important part, the much more important part and that's, I'm glad we're touching on it, is seeking knowledge. Okay. Again, I hate calling it seeking help yeah. because when you call it seeking knowledge, you kind of put the perfect timing on when you should yeah. seek that knowledge. It's okay to and seek help though, I think. Right? It's okay to seek help, of course. It's, well, it's the same, you know, I just use a different it makes vocabulary. You, okay, yeah, it, just it sits better with you. <laughs> it, it, it sits better with me and I feel like we have to start making it sit better with the Arab region. Yes. And when you keep saying, seek help, seek help, seek help, unfortunately, in the Arab region today, people correlate help with, you know, uh, crazy or yeah. help yeah. with, uh, you know, sick. Yeah. So, okay, how about I'm going to seek knowledge. What are, what are you going to call yeah, me now? And I think <laughs> therapy is the idea of like therapy has gotten such a negative stigma as uh -huh. well in this region. So I guess, yes, let's let's use the word knowledge. Yeah, right. we <laughs> seek knowledge because the thing is when you use the word seek knowledge, it doesn't put a specific time on when you should seek the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So when you say seek help, you're kind of saying, okay, go talk to a therapist when something is wrong. Mm -hmm. When something is wrong, when you have a problem in your life, go speak to a therapist, go speak to a psychiatrist, go speak to a life coach. Yeah. When you say seek knowledge, you say regardless of whatever is happening in your life, Go speak to a therapist, go speak to a psychiatrist, go speak to a life coach. And that is what I'm a big believer on because that's what saved me. I, I went and I spoke to a mental performance coach and a therapist and a, spokes uh, and a sports psychologist long before anything was ever wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, actually, it's way more important to speak to them when things are going great. Yeah. Because the way life is, it's not going to always stay great. And if you want it to go back to great after it crashes down for a while, you're going to have to know how to manage the tools when you crash down. Right. And it's a lot easier to maintain things going great when you have those tools as well. So seek knowledge. Go speak to a therapist, a life coach, a mental coach, whatever it is. They're all amazing people in their field. Go speak to them when, when, whenever you want. Not when things are going wrong, not when things are going bad. That's not why they're there. You know, we, growing up, you don't learn alone how to walk. You don't learn alone how to talk. You don't learn it alone how to eat, drink, you know, Read, ex really. everything. Yeah. Somebody teaches you, you watch someone doing it, you shadow someone, then you pick up and you learn. 
So how is it and why is it when it comes to our mental health, we're expected to know it ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're expected to teach ourselves. Not only that, we're expected to teach ourselves perfectly. Yeah. We're expected to never cry. We're expected to never get upset. We're expected to never get depressed, never get angry, never lose control of our emotions. We're expected to do all of that. Mm -hmm. So how is it we're expected to do that when somebody t taught us how to eat and drink yeah. and walk? Yeah. So these are professionals who've, who have now, some of them have PhDs. They've went through university. They've went through years and years of learning just to teach you they are professionals and they are experts just to teach you how to do it. Yeah. So do that. Go and seek the knowledge early on. Why did you do that? Because that's also not a very common thing in the Arab world to go when there's nothing wrong, right? Yeah. We do everything when there's something wrong. Like even in the world of, you know, my world of wellness and fitness, people most of the time come to us when they're trying to fix a heart problem, cholesterol problem, I'm yeah. overweight, I want to lose weight. Yeah. We never just do it because it's the right thing to do all the time because we need it just for our growth in general. So what made you in the region that we're at, at the time that we're at, decide I'm going to go get knowledge when there was nothing wrong? Again, two things. First of all, the, the first thing is I assess the situation. You know, it was, it's no secret in my career to, to my audience, to my supporters, to anybody following the journey. It's no secret in my career that the mental part of my career is what's the hardest part of my career. And I knew that even before I traveled abroad, to turn professional. You know, when I first decided to turn professional, I traveled abroad and I knew that assessing the situation, I'm going to be far away from my family. I went to Los Angeles. So I'm going to be far away from my family. I'm going to be far away from my friends. I had no friends there. Mm. I'm going to, there's going to be a huge time difference. So they're going to be asleep most of the time whenever I'm going through anything, if I go through anything. And I'm in a very uncomfortable place. So then I assessed the situation and I said, the boxing I know how to do. I've been boxing my whole life. What is it that I might face that might really disrupt this journey and slow it down yeah. at a time where I need to accelerate it because I need to be steps ahead of the people who have lived abroad their whole life, trained abroad with the equipment, with the, with the boxing IQ, the high level coaches, I need to accelerate my journey to catch up to them. And I knew and I had a feeling, you know, that what I'd probably struggle with most is the mental part of the journey. Saudi Arabia, the pressure, the stress, me not being as good as the people abroad. I will probably lose a lot of matches. I will, I will not perform my best in training. My family's away. My friends are away. They're sleeping because of time difference. I'm in an unfamiliar country. Mental, the mental part is what I'm really going to mm. struggle with. So how do I make sure to the best of my capabilities and best of my abilities that I won't struggle or at least if I struggle and it's okay to struggle. But when I struggle, not if, <laughs> yeah. but when I struggle, yeah. I will have the tools to properly struggle. Mm. And I'm not going to say the tools to get out of the struggle because sometimes there are struggles that will stay with you your whole life. Mm. You just manage it perfectly. You manage it so well most of the days, not all days. Most of the days you manage it so well because all days is unrealistic. Yeah. There will come days where yeah. emotions, hormones, everything is going to play a part where you're just not going to be in control that day. And that's okay, yeah. but have the tools. Yeah. So that's what I did. I just went and seeked out someone who I could get these tools from. And this is the, the funny part. The first sports psychologist I, I spoke with he was in charge, you know, of the players that are with the Lakers, you know, one of the biggest basketball teams, you know, the biggest athletes in the U.S. And I spoke to him for months. Wasn't, wasn't it. Wasn't it because a big part of my mental state is my identity yeah. and my culture. So then I realized that, you know what, I feel like I need somebody from the Arab world. Yeah. I need someone from the Arab world. And that's where I met uh, Haytham Ghito, who is uh, now my mental performance coach. He's Egyptian. I was sitting down just looking at, you know, searching, searching on Instagram, finding someone he had. Now he has over 10,000 followers. Then he had 200 followers. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, that field wasn't huge, you know, but he really, when I spoke to him, when I speak to him about, I'm doing this for my country. I'm doing this for my parents, my family. 
my, uh, my religion. He understands. Yeah. Rather than when you speak to an American sports psychologist, sometimes you tell him, I'm doing this for my parents. There isn't the same connection of parents yeah. <laughs> in the Arab world yeah. than that it yeah. does in the, you know, in, the, in the States. And so that's where I, that's what really pushed me to seek the knowledge. Yeah. And, that, and seeking knowledge, you know, seeking knowledge has made me avoid ever getting to the point where I'm seeking help. But if I get to the point where I have to seek help, it's okay to seek help, yeah. you know? Yeah. And me and my uh, mental coach are already best friends now. We already have a great relationship. So when I need to seek help, not knowledge, it's ready. Yeah. It's there. He understands me. He knows me. That's why I always say, seek knowledge. Go now. Go speak to a therapist yeah. now, a mental performance coach now, life coach, whatever it is. I'd, I'd advise a life coach. If there's nothing wrong, if you feel like there's nothing wrong, if it makes you feel better, uh, you know, especially with the stigma around it, okay, go speak to a life coach. Yeah. A life coach will eventually take you to a therapist. <laughs> You'll no, see. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, because I think it's really important. Like, you know, one of the things I learned for myself and the things like we teach now at Ignite is like, don't like try and learn these new skills mm. in the moments where you've completely so you know, brought, been brought to the ground, right? It's very important to do it a little bit in, you know, the low hanging fruit in your everyday life because mm -hmm. then you're acquiring those tools and those skills so that when you find yourself in those situations, you already have the skill set and the tools and the knowledge to be able to bring yourself into a space to figure out what is it actually I'm supposed to learn from this? Or exactly. What are the things I actually am meant to be learning and doing and needing in my life right now? And I realize most of the time when I end up feeling like this, it's because... I kind of came out of alignment with who I am as a person and my own purpose in my own life. And I think most of us with like a dissociation of, am I doing what I actually want? Who am I? What is that to begin with? Mm. And then am I, am I living my life for other people or am I living it for myself? Exactly. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you're, you're, you're boxing because you want to make all these people proud. Is, is, do you feel like boxing is also for you? Definitely. You know, boxing is for me because it makes a lot of people proud. This is who I am. This yeah. is part of who I am. You know, it's uh, so many people always tell me, even members of my team, you know, my coach, my managers, they, they see the mental toll it takes on me when I'm approaching a fight. The mental toll it takes on me after I've won a fight, you know, and they say you have to stop putting that kind of pressure on yourself. If I don't put that pressure on myself, it's not worth it. If I don't put that pressure that might run me into a journey that might, you know, destroy me or a crash course, it's, it's no problem because then it's not worth it for me. I'd rather go through the journey with the mental toll it takes on me because of the pressure that I'm carrying and the hope that I have of so many people on me and that whole weight on my back. I'd rather go through the journey learning how to manage that and maybe learning how to manage that perfectly, maybe not. I'd rather go through it like that mm. than to go through it completely normally with, with just the pressure of myself on my performance and, and all of that. So I, I just love boxing because of what it means for me outside of boxing, especially in today's era, in today's Saudi Arabia and, and in today's Arab world as well where you give hope and you're, and I've said that before, where you're a symbol to so many people, you're a symbol of hope to so many people, where if someone feels like they're at a point where they're at a disadvantage um, in trying to accomplish something because of a lack of equipment or a lack of opportunity, I teach them how to have hope, or God teaches them how to have hope through me, through, you, yeah. through my journey. Mm -hmm. um, to just, I didn't have the equipment, I didn't have the opportunity, but I had to find the confidence that bred the hope that made me get there. Yeah. But there was a very good point um, you touched on where, um, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to learn new tools in, in moments of, you know, destroyed emotions, right? Or, yeah, yeah. or hectic emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, you, I think you don't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> Right. And the second one is you always fall back to your habits mm. in moments of high stress, high pressure and, you know, difficult emotions. You will always fall back to your habits. 
And so we need to change your habits. Right. But the only way to change your habits is not trying to change them in high stress moments because you're going to fall on the old ones. Yeah. So this isn't the time to change your habits. Mm -hmm. So when you seek knowledge, <laughs> not help, right? When you seek the knowledge, it's easier to change your habits because it takes time. Yeah. It takes time to change habits. And, and let's not even call it change habits because that's, not, that's unrealistic. Alter, alter habits. Yeah. Learn how learning to, new yeah, habits. you know, uh, learning new habits, altering older habits, and then learning how to deal with the negative older habits yeah. as well that get you to points of difficulty and stuff. So just dealing with your habits and learning new ones and altering the old ones is a lot easier to do when you're mm -hmm. seeking that knowledge when things are going great because it's very important to deal with, with yourself mm -hmm. when things are going great as well. Right, it's very easy to get caught. Yeah, it's, get, true. it's very easy to get caught in your head and mm -hmm. start feeling that you're something yeah, <laughs> when yeah. things are going great, yeah. not knowing that soon it's gonna go back down. Yeah, because you know life's in waves, right? Sometimes we're exactly. there, sometimes we're down, and when we're down, it's always just for us to. It's always an opportunity for us to grow because all yeah. of life is about evolution and change. And you know, I think when we're comfortable, we don't find the need to change and grow. And when we're uncomfortable, that's when we start seeking the knowledge. Exactly. To do exactly. That. Um, so at every phase of our lives, I feel like there's always like the um, our purpose may remain the same if we're very clear on that purpose early on, and then sometimes it kind of changes. Has the reason you box changed throughout your career, or is it still the, is it the same throughout it all? It's definitely changed um, in a moment where you know I was from 11 years old to 16 years old. It's changed then to whatever happened after because when i when i said when i first started what really started what made me start boxing and get into boxing was seeking self value yeah when it's a lot easier to start boxing than to stay in boxing staying in the sport especially the more serious it gets especially the mental for me personally the mental toll it might take on me the pressure, the stress, um, me fighting. If anybody knows anything about my career and journey, I only fight on the big cards. I only fight on the big boxing events. Alhamdulillah, of course, but because of Saudi and because of what they're doing and me being a Saudi fighter, and what are the chances, you know, that Saudi Arabia choose to initiate a whole vision 2030 and the sport they choose to invest in most is boxing? And then what are the chances that there's a young boxer that has been training and preparing for close to a decade, you know, ready for, for the stages and, and those moments. So it's very hard to look at the journey and the career and not think that there's something written and something prepared from a higher power for this journey that just keeps me sticking to it, wanting to see what will happen. And me just being six fights in right now, fighting on the biggest stages. I've only been a pro for two years, six fights, but the story has been huge. And the mainstream media, alhamdulillah, has been huge and the international audience and, and the lives that I could impact and change. So the reason has definitely changed from seeking self-value to seeking um, giving value, you know, giving someone their self-value. That's how my reason has changed. So it went from me and my self-value to helping others find their own self-value, to helping others seek self-value through whatever they're trying to go through. And that's what I love this journey. That's definitely how the purpose of it has, has changed. You know, before we started the episode, I was just showing you photos of how I might, you know, the state of myself and how you know, the mental toll could have me looking after a fight yeah. mentally yeah. or even before a fight mentally. But imagine after a win, but you're just so, you know, that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah, I actually like wanted to touch, have to. I wanted to touch base on that because I think that's really important. And it's not something I've personally ever thought about before because I'm not in the sport, so I don't understand it. But when you said it to me, I thought, oh, my gosh, that's really fascinating. And it's unlike most sports where you end up finishing winning but then feeling completely mentally and emotionally yeah. like dead and exhausted yeah and one i'm very curious about why that happens but two 
I want to know what you do in moments like that. Um, I don't know 100% why it happens, okay. which is part of, you know, uh, being able to handle it when yeah. it happens. It's just to not try to search for 100% of the answers when I do go through it. But here's the thing about boxing. So the, the fight night is 45 minutes, you know, and it's one fight. It's what happens before that, that really gets to you. So for anybody who doesn't know, before every fight, we have a training camp of minimum two months. It's a minimum of eight weeks. And in those eight weeks, you train every single day, even, you know, the weekends. You train every single day for eight weeks. And boxing is a weight-making sport as well. Okay. So in my regular everyday life, I'm 75 kilograms. But when I fight, I fight at 62 kilograms. So it's a weight-making sport where in the eight weeks, you go through, you know, the calorie deficit, and it's a performance, nutrition, calorie deficit. And uh, what we need to understand about when you're, when you're on a calorie deficit and you're a high-performance individual, sometimes things are going to happen in your body, in your emotions, in your hormones that you can't control. Yeah. You know, being on a calorie deficit means you're on a negative energy balance. Yeah. There are going to be so many days in training camp where you're going to need the positive energy balance just to restore your, your clarity, your thoughts, your, um, your, you know, positive attitude. But you can't have that yeah. because you're on a negative energy balance. You need to keep losing the weight and you need to, the, as the weeks go by, you're losing more weight, but you're expected to perform higher as the weeks go by. Yeah. So... Me having to do that in a training camp, it's an individual sport, so you're alone. You don't have your team and stuff. You're alone. It's you're, just you and your coach? It's just you, your coach, and I have my dog as well, <laughs> you know? <laughs> okay. So it's, it's, um, it's just, and, but you don't live together. Everybody's alone, so I, it's very, I don't know why it's known in boxing where you just have to be isolated. I'm going to touch on that point later where, you know, we have to separate isolation from loneliness. It's not the same yeah, thing. Yeah, very important, actually. Okay. But go back to that. it's having to be alone, again, with a time difference in an unfamiliar country, unfamiliar place, no friends, no family. We switch countries and cities every once in a while. So you keep staying in that uncomfort zone. And why do you do that? Because you have to be isolated and the only way to be isolated is to be uncomfortable okay. you could be alone in a very comfortable place and not feel isolated yeah you know that uh, you could leave me in my house uh here now and i could stay there forever mm. i'm not going to feel lonely or isolated because mm. i'm so comfortable but the only way to remain isolated is to be uncomfortable and uh through isolation we reach elevation so through isolation, we reach elevation. Elevation in our thoughts, in our ideas, in our performance, in our focus, in our sharpness. You know, and that's what I wanted to separate loneliness from isolation. Right. Because when you're lonely, you don't get thoughts. You don't get that, those peak thoughts. You don't get those peak ideas, your peak performance. When you're lonely, you're doing nothing about it. I mean, you mean alone? Or do you mean lonely? I mean lonely because, because here's the thing. You could be alone and not be lonely. Yes. You could be alone and be isolated. So yes. that, what I mean is... No, because for me, I've always heard alone and the lonely. Yeah. This is the first time I'm hearing isolation. No. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, now I'm trying to differentiate between the three. Yeah, no. My thing is when you're chasing something, when you're chasing something, when you have a goal, when you're alone... This is what differentiates when you're isolated and when you're lonely. You could be alone when you're doing nothing about it, when you're doing nothing towards your goal or when you're doing nothing to, um, towards helping you to reach that goal you have in mind or helping you to get through a moment to then get out of a specific situation and you're alone, that's when you're lonely, okay. when you're doing nothing about it. Right. You know, and sometimes... It's okay to feel like I don't want to do anything about it. Okay, then it's okay to feel lonely too. Right. But eventually, you will have to do something about it to get out of it. Or eventually, you will have to do something about it to reach your goal, to yeah. reach your purpose, to reach your 
achievement. Yeah. So then that's isolation. Because mm. then when you're isolated, you put yourself in that uncomfortable position, knowing that high stress prepares you for the big moments, mm. not high stress stops you from the big mm. moments. So then you know that when you're isolated, you're elevated. Elevated thoughts, elevated ideas, elevated performance, elevated everything. And I think maybe you could relate. I think maybe a lot of people here could relate. I personally get my best ideas when I'm alone. Yeah. <laughs> I get Absolutely. my best ideas when I'm alone. I work best when I'm alone and I focus best when I'm alone. So not because you're alone, you're lonely. Yeah. And, you know, Absolutely. and it's amazing to be alone and be isolated. And that's what training camp is. That's where the mental toll takes place because that's where I have to balance the pressure. Okay. The stress I'm building to a big fight on a very big event, 20, 30,000 people watching. I, this is only my fifth, since my fifth or my sixth fight, but they're putting me on such huge events that only people in their 40th and 50th fight uh, are on, which is, again, a huge privilege. With as much pressure comes just as much privilege. Yeah. But strangely so, this is, this is what really breaks you down. This is what really eats a little part of you every single time. Then you get to the fight, you get to fight week, fight week, you stop training, you're tapering down. You have to manage the pressure, the stress, the crowd, the press, the media. You're seeing your opponent every day, you're facing off with your opponent every day. So then when it's all said and done, you don't have to weigh in, you don't have to check your weight, you don't have to train two and three times a day, every day, balance the pressure of a whole country or a whole side of the world on your back, kids looking up to you, people placing their hopes on you, and you having to do something that with your experience that you have so far, with the level that you're at so far, you're not even expected to be close to that level, but you have to past that level, yeah. even though you don't have the, the experience to give you that confidence. So then you pass that level, you know, by, you know, by God, you pass that level by, I wouldn't say work, the work even is from, the, from God, but you showing up at least, yeah. pass that level, then you just, that's it, yeah. you're drained. And like I was telling you, sometimes the two months that has prepared you to get into that mental state of the fight, Sometimes it takes that same amount of a month or even two to get back out of that mental state and start living your normal life. I do have friends that I speak to, family that I can visit, and my biggest pressure in life right now is what am I going to eat next? <laughs> you know, not uh, who am I going to fight, who am I going to... So that's, uh, that's the, I think that's what breaks me down the most. And I, I never hold back from speaking about it. Because it's yeah. part of the journey. It's part of who I am. Yeah. I'm not here to be some kind of tough guy. Again, I have nothing to prove. Yeah. I prove all I need to in the nights I fight. Yeah. You know, in the 45 doesn't... minutes where... Exactly. In the 45 minutes I fight. I could speak about my vulnerabilities and what I go through now. It doesn't change that I still win my fights. You don't have that option to just switch off. Not at all. Because if you don't make weight, you don't fight. So it's like, that's why they say in boxing, it's two fights. The weight and the fight. Mm. The weight thing is huge. And you lose a lot of weight to fight. So it's like, if you, once you weigh in, you weigh in the day before the fight. Once you weigh in, it's actually a celebration that day. Oh my God. I swear, because you've won that fight. And how do you get to celebrate? Yeah, you've won you that fight. Because you can't do it with going go, out or eating. Or yeah, <laughs> but you carb load. You oh, start, you do. Yeah, yeah, you okay. carb load. You start, now the weight is done. You've officially weighed in. Okay. Now it's time to rehydrate, carb load again for the fight. So how, uh, what is the uh, difference in time between like the weigh-in and then the actual fight? It's about a day and a half. So okay. you weigh in uh, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., the day before the fight, and you end up fighting 6, 7 p.m. Mo okay. Most usually they're not. Yeah, the day okay. after. You have all the sodium back in you, the water back in you. Because fight week, it's very weird. You cut out carbs, you cut out sodium, you do something called water loading. Mm. That's a very complex thing, <laughs> mm. you know? But yeah, you, you get to that point and yeah just like i said this it's a process of breaking you down yeah. to the fight but for me the fight in the states um other than the the heat other than the opponent being southpaw other than you know my u.s debut i know that the judges are american too and i'm arab you know so it's like <laughs> i know that 
those pressure on me to really win the fight in a convincing way where yeah. none of the judges can try to screw me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because of the whole conflict happening and Saudi and this, that. Mm. You never know. You were mentioning to me um, before we had started on camera here um, that you, this last match was really, really, really difficult. One of the mm. most difficult matches you had. And you were saying like you got into like round four or five, something like that, and uh, you were completely just exhausted. And yeah. your opponent was like fully on and got his energy back. How did you come back from that? Like, how do you, because this always really fascinates me, that space inside of our minds that has the ability to make us as entire beings recognize that we are infinitely powerful and everything that we c want can actually take place, especially in the moments when we are completely depleted. Mm. How did you come back from that? It's knowing that each one of us in us has a second win. You have a second win. And when I say second win, I don't just mean stamina. Or I don't just mean when you're doing something physically. Uh, I mean that even mentally you have a second wind. But the only way to unlock that second wind is to know that and understand that the only way to unlock it is to understand and know that I am tired from the first one. Don't try to, you know, escape you being tired uh, in round four. And so when I say second wind, I mean that that second set of push, that new set of push, that, that second set of uh, willingness, that second set of motivation, discipline, uh, you know, all, all of the emotions. You have just a second set of it that will only unlock in high stress moments, that will only unlock in high risk moments. But to unlock it, you need to understand that you are in a high stress moment, you are in a high risk moment, and that you are tired. You are tired and it's okay to be tired. If I'm in a boxing fight and it's round four and I'm starting to breathe so hard in my fights, the one minute I have between the round and the other, I need to understand, okay, now I need to nasal breathe. I need to control my emotions. I need to control my breath. And if I'm not able to control it, I don't panic because it's okay to not be able to control it fully because I'm in a very tough fight and I'm very tired. But it's to just know that, okay, now it's fight or flight, right? And we all have that in us. It's either fight or flight. But it's not you're born with it and you, you're either a person who will fight or you're either a person who will flight. It's what are you doing before that fight or flight kicks in that decides which one are you going to go to. So the more you run away from unwanted emotions, the more they, the more they run after you. So the more you run away from unwanted emotions, the more they run after you. But if you stand and you meet them, you win. And if you stand and you meet them, then you get to know them and you get to use them for your second wind. So in round four, when I go into round five and I'm dead tired and, you know, very strangely, my opponent is getting his best second wind ever. He's gotten his energy He's punching harder, he's punching faster, he's very alert, very sharp, very awake. I'm panicking. Right now I'm, I'm panicking, I'm panicking because the last two rounds are very important and I'm tired. My defense isn't the best, I'm getting punched a lot, all of that. But if I run away from that panic, it will always run after me. Then that's flight, right? But if I stand and I meet that panic, I'm like, okay, I'm panicking. Actually, I was hyperventilating in between the rounds. I was breathing. My breathing was all over the place. But my coach told me, control your breath. It's okay. You're ready. You're, you've been there. So then I controlled the panic. And I understand that I need to win whatever battle I'm facing, regardless of the panic. I need to win the battle I'm facing with the panic there. If you wait for the panic to leave in a high-stress moment, where the odds are stacked, stacked against you, it's never going to leave. Right. If you wait for the fear, the stress, the pressure to leave in a high stress moment, it's never going to leave. But if you understand that you need to get through and go through the moment, regardless of those unwanted emotions being there, then you understand that the unwanted emotions are actually needed emotions to get through it.
So then you get that second win, then this is where you get to choose the, f the fight and not the flight, just how you control the emotion. Yeah. I think it's actually a really uh, important thing that you just said, because it's, you know, when a lot of the times, especially, I mean, I think the entire world is like this right now, right? Where you're like, no, no, you're not scared, or no, you're not tired, yeah. or, oh, you're going to be fine. And then, you know, kids are taught that, you know, don't trust your emotions, like we know better what's happening inside of you. And then the, us as kids become adults, and then we start running away from those really uncomfortable like fr emotions of frustration, of sadness, of being scared. And it's a really important thing that you just touched on. I think everybody will kind of, it'll resonate with everyone. This thing of whatever emotion arises, embrace that emotion, recognize that yeah. it's there, and then know that you have to get through it anyways. If you, can't, if you run away from it, it'll always follow you. Yeah. You can't run away from emotion that exists within you. Yeah, you have to embrace change. Mm. And uh, when I say embrace change, I don't just mean embrace change uh, in your life, in your career, in your uh, position. No, I mean embrace change in every aspect of your life. Embrace change even in your emotions. The little moments where your emotions might change in a specific situation, embrace that. Yeah. Embrace that because it's the only way you'll grow from it. Yeah. If you don't embrace it, then you try to avoid it. And if you try to avoid it, you'll never go through it to grow from it. Yeah. But if you embrace the emotion, you definitely grow from it. And like I said before, the best thing about it is when you know that you go through a situation, when you get through the situation, you will go through a much bigger situation later on, but you are not the same person that is going through that same situation. Yeah. You are a very different person. Yeah. You are a very elevated person. You are a next level person who now not only knows how to deal with emotions, but the best way to deal with emotions is knowing when to expect them and how to expect them. So you're not a different person because now you are much better at dealing with sadness. Right. You're a different person because now you are much better at expecting sadness. And you are not a different person because you are much better at dealing with, um, you know, anger. You are just a different person because now you know when to expect anger. And you know that it's okay to have anger. Expect, expect fear. Expect anger, expect pressure, expect stress. But when you go through it the first time, what makes it so hard to go through it is you didn't expect all of those emotions. Mm -hmm. You didn't yeah. expect going through, um, when you go through, for example, um, a, a job you applied for that you didn't get, mm -hmm. or a risk you took that you didn't get at the end, or a breakup that you go through when you go through it. Whatever it is you are facing in life, what makes it so hard to control and, and feel so horrible getting through is the emotions that you're having that you didn't expect. You didn't expect fear now. Yeah. You didn't expect anger. You didn't expect sadness. You didn't expect all of them. But when you go through it again, because you will apply for a job you won't get, you will take a risk that won't work out, and you will go through maybe uh, one or more, if it's not a breakup, a lost friendship, a lost relationship with somebody or, or someone that means a lot, you will go through it again, but this time at least you know okay, I'm feeling sad, but I expected that. Yeah. I'm feeling angry, I've expected that because I've went through it before. So and you I touch think as on well, that. Like, it's really important to kind of have a, learn to have, I think, more elevated or evolved perspective. Like when I apply for the job and I don't get it, it's also the understanding that it was never mine to begin with. Exactly. You know? and it's like, if it was mine, I would have gotten it. And so I think in doing that, the disappointment will eventually go away because you now understand the world and the mm. way it works a little bit more differently. And then once you've also given yourself the tools, even if you are disappointed, you have the tools in your toolbox to help you get through that disappointment. Yeah, definitely. It's, you know, it's tawakkul. Yeah. Tawakkul for me is everything, everything. Because before you achieve anything, you're going to lose countless achievements before it. Yeah. You know, before you get a hold of something, you're going to, uh, have so much loss from your hands countless times before it. And that's what tawakkul really is, right? Where you just have to trust that everything is going to work out at the end. Mm -hmm. Everything will always work out at the end. And actually, when it feels like it won't work out the most, it's where it's preparing you for, you know, when it works out the most. So whenever you go through something where you feel like you're at your worst, you know, you, you've lost all hope, 
you've lost, you know, all willingness. It's in those moments that prepares you the most for the moment that will require the most willingness, the most hope. Because if you look back at everything you've went through, each and every one of us, every single time you look back, at something and you feel like you there was no way out and you're still here today there was a way out yes and it ended up ending it ended up with you getting through it and going through it but the only way to get through it is to go through it yeah that's why i always say get and go in anything mm -hmm. i uh, i speak about because there's a very big difference you know getting through something we need to understand will require going through something right. going through its emotions going through its bad days its good days going through um just the opinions of people or or the opinions of yourself on yeah. uh, on you you're gonna have to go through all that to get through a situation but when you're feeling like that the most yeah. this is where you find yourself sitting at your lowest and you're like, no, you know what? I pick myself up. All of a sudden, peak willingness, yeah. peak motivation, peak hope. And then you get through the bigger situations. Mm -hmm. So yes. I love that part, to be honest, the tawakkul part, because it always ends up working out. Yeah. No cool. matter what happens, always ends up working out. And you realize that what you wanted and what you got were very different because what you wanted was not what you should have gotten. Yeah. And what you got was exactly what you needed. Yeah. And that's the beautiful part about talk. Amen to that. <laughs> um, so now at this stage of your life, when you look back, what is something your younger self would not believe about your life right now? Everything about it now, to be honest. <laughs> Everything about it now from sitting here doing this podcast to me uh, fighting on the biggest boxing events. I think it, it's just so so surreal and uh, because of how impossible it was for a Saudi boxer to make it in global and mainstream media boxing it, it wouldn't have been even accepted in my head and in my thoughts that it could happen now yes when I was training when I was younger that was my goal my goal was to the people that I see on YouTube the fighters that, because we didn't even have boxing on TV, the boxers that I'm seeing on YouTube, the legends, I'm going to do what they do and they, I'm gonna, I want to be like them and I, I will get there. And that's why when I moved abroad, I moved to LA only because the fighter I look up to trained in LA. I went to his gym. So I just followed through a plan that I set because the only way, or let me say, there is no way to not make it or there is no way to not get to something that is written for you if you do not like put in the work and stop so there is no way to fail if you keep going if you just set up the path and you stick to the path walk crawl you know run whatever you want to do just stick to the path stay on the path and there is no way to not make it there's no way to not get there if you just stick to the path. If it's written for you, you still have to stick to the path. You can't not, you know, <laughs> you can't swerve off the path and, and go here, go there and not do anything about it and still be convinced you get what, what's written for you that you really want, you know? Yeah. And so uh, it's just stick to it. Stick yeah. to whatever you're trying to do. And then eventually the people who are in that same race you know, unfortunately, so many people uh, more often than not give up. And but if you accept that, that's a lot better for you. You actually understand that if you're the one that keeps sticking to the path and you're the one that sticks to the race, you'll be the only one left. Yeah. And then you'll get to whatever everybody is trying to reach, but nobody's trying or nobody's willing to go through what they have to go through to reach it. But you, you are you are willing, you are ready. And you'll get to it. If it's written for you, mm. you'll get to it. And then, you know, prayer, that changes everything, right? Yeah. So you pray for it, you pray for it, you pray for it. It changes color, so it could happen. Yeah, absolutely. So sometimes when I feel like I don't have clarity, because I think we all have these moments, I always like to kind of imagine my life, you know, when I'm 70 or 80. 
And then I pause and I think, okay, like what advice, if I was 80, <laughs> would I be giving myself like right now at this stage of my life? And now I want to ask you that question. What advice would your 80-year-old uh, Zied version be giving your now version about your life, you think? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say why I'm not going to think about that. Okay. <laughs> but, also, <laughs> but also tell you why this is the same advice. Okay. So why I'm not going to think about that is because I need to stay in the present. Okay. I want to stay in the present, always. I've always suffered from going to the future. Mm. And, you know, this is where the pressure and the stress that you can't do anything about yeah. comes. That's the worst part of, mm. that's the worst kind of pressure and stress. Pressure, stress and, and fear and worry that you get from the future and the ones that you get from the past is the worst because you can't do anything about it. Yeah. You can't change it. You can't control it. But the one you get in the present is the one you can change, control, and, and do something about. Mm. So I won't think about it because I will stay in the present. In the present. But my advice to my younger self, <laughs> I was eight years old, yeah. would be to stay in the present. Yeah. Always stay in the present. I, I've spoken about what I call the time traveler theory. And the time traveler theory is if you have to time travel to make sure of it and control it, or if you have to time travel to change it, then you can't do anything about it. Yeah. And that's it. If you have to time travel for it, if it's the past or the future, if it's to tomorrow or if it's to yesterday, then you can't change it mm. and you can't do anything about I love it. That. So you have to stay in the in present. The, present yeah. so the advice would be the same. Always stay in the present because the present will give you tomorrow and the present will change yesterday. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how it is. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, so... I think because I think with what you're doing, this really is really relevant, actually. What is it you feel you want to use your life for? What do you want your legacy to be while you're here? Just impact as many lives and change as many lives as I can outside of boxing. You know, through boxing, not in boxing, yeah. but through boxing yeah. to outside of boxing. Like, like Muhammad Ali, right? Where he's known more for what he's done outside of boxing, where he had to go to jail actually for it. And for anybody who doesn't know, you know, you see how we speak about Muhammad Ali today? Yeah. You know, we've never seen his prime in boxing. He went to jail at 23, he came out at 28. So we never saw the prime of fighting of Muhammad Ali. We never saw it. We never saw peak speed, peak power, peak stamina. We just saw a young one and we saw a very old one. We saw a young Muhammad Ali that used to move and dance around the ring. Then he gets suspended, goes to jail, comes out. Then we saw a very old Muhammad Ali that didn't move, that didn't dance, wasn't the same Muhammad Ali, but still won all his fights, still did some extraordinary things. Was, you know, the Muhammad Ali we speak about today, but we speak about him so much today because of what he did uh, with the Vietnam War, not wanting to go, what he did for, uh, for his own people, uh, you know, with the separations in the U.S. or how he was a big advocate for peace, how is he, he was also a big advocate for ment mental health. He was a big advocate for all of that, and mm. he changed so much. So that's why we speak about him till today. Mm. We don't speak about him because he was great as a fighter. We speak about him because he was great as a person, and that's what I want to do, especially in today's era of, of what Saudi Arabia is doing, what the Arab world is doing, but really what Saudi Arabia is doing with the talents coming up with the importance of the talents who are coming up to have somebody to look up to. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what I want to, you know, be when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, I want to be that, that you know, that symbol of hope, mm -hmm. that superhero, mm -hmm. as you could say, that changed so many lives. If someone is going through anything mentally, they could look at my journey look at what I've said in my journey and look at what I've done through my journey and, and regain purpose, regain hope, regain or maybe even self, find self-value, right. you know, embrace the change, all the stuff that I always speak about, but I don't just speak about it. It's, I speak about it because without it, it's impossible to be where I am today. Without it, it's, an, it's impossible to go through what I have to go through today to eventually get to, you know, yeah, so that's, that's what I want to be, I mm -hmm. guess.
Okay, so there's this little thing that we do at the end of every episode. I'm just going to start some sentences and I want you to finish them for me. And we don't do them quickly. They're okay. really, they're the question, not questions, they're sentences to kind of think about. And it's always really interesting to see how everyone answers them for their own lives very differently. Okay. Okay. Um, I want the world to know. That it's okay to not be okay. Mm. <laughs> it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the world needs. To seek knowledge. <laughs> the world needs to seek knowledge. Uh, clarity comes from... Never. Clarity, 100% clarity never comes. So clarity comes from understanding that clarity does not come. That's what I truly believe. You look for 100% clarity, clarity will never come. Understanding that there will never be 100% clarity, then clarity will come. Because clarity, I guess, comes from calmness then. Mm. Clarity comes from calmness. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, love is? You. Love is you. Mm. <laughs> it starts with you, I guess. Love starts with you and then you end up loving a lot more proper later then. Yeah, yeah it absolutely does. It has to start. Yeah. The starting point <laughs> is you. And then, it can, then you can learn to love the world and everything yeah. that's outside of you in the correct, proper way. The more you know about yourself, the more you know about others. Yeah. That's what I always that's say. The more you know how to deal with your anger, the more you know how to deal with your insecurities, your vulnerabilities, your worries, your fears, the more you'll understand dealing with other people's vulnerabilities, insecurities, angers, and fears. The more you're self-compassionate, the more you are compassionate with others. Absolutely. And the final one, my life's purpose is to be a superhero. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My life's purpose is to be a superhero, to be a symbol, I guess, but to to still have a Zizo long before, long after Zizo is gone, I guess. Mm -hmm. So the, to to always have a Zizo there for people to just talk about, look up to, and and chase their dreams because of Ziada Mayuf, because you know, long after I'm gone, I won't be here to speak about it. So yeah. hopefully, I've done enough for it to speak about it for itself. Okay, there's actually one more I'm going to follow up with and then, and then we'll end. Um, now that you said that, when people look back on your life, what do you want them to feel about Zizou? Think hope. Hope, yeah. Just want them to feel hope. Because like I said, you know, hope is not something that is created for you or presented to you, it's something that you have to create yourself. Yeah. But if, if, if you, it starts with a feeling, you know? So if you feel it by looking back at my story, then you're able to create it. And then you take off from there yeah. to your own journey, your own achievements, do it bigger and better than Zizo, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. inshallah. inshallah. That's, the, that's, the, that's the dream. Zizo, thank you so much. Thank this has you. been beautiful. Thank Honestly, you. It, was, it took away a lot of really little nuggets I think I'm going to carry throughout my own life. Yeah, so thank no, you. I loved it. I loved it. And, and you know, after every big fight, I love to do a podcast because it's therapy for me. Amazing. So this I'm was, happy this, this was, was, was in one. such a big fight. <laughs> yeah, this thank one you. was a big one. Thank <laughs> Thanks. you. Thanks.